every human being, whether he be a believer or a disbeliever, they're being told this. So this is not just a, a declaration to Muslims, it's a declaration to humanity. Oh, human beings, you've all been, you are no doubt, each and every one of you is actively engaged in toiling labor. Now let's see what kind of toiling labor. First, Kadh. It's been uh, described by Al-Shawkani. Al-Kadh fi kalam al-Arab. السعي في الشيء بجهد من غير فرق من غير فرق بين أن يكون ذلك الشيء خيرا أو شرا. This is a struggle towards something without any distinction, and it's a, it's a laborsome struggle without any distinction, distinction whether it's a good thing or bad thing. You're just engaged in it. You just gotta get it done. You don't care if it's good or bad. So it's not it's not an evil work or a good work necessarily. It's just work altogether. Then we find جهد في جهد النفس في العمل والكد فيه. This is what you know, uh, we find by Zamakhshari, the linguistic tafsir of Qur'an. He says this is the struggle, the toil of a person in the work that they are engaged in and to be immersed in it entirely till, till the point where they, their body even gets exhausted. Their body gets you know, tired from that work, that project that they have before them. Now see, all of this, you know, when we do hard work, we have that goal in front of us, but Allah puts us different goal. He says, إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحٌ you are engaged in this act of work rigorously, non-stop, day in and day out, business, business, business. You go to somebody, how's it going? Alhamdulillah, how's work? Man, it's a lot of work, yeah. Busy, busy, you know. It's always that. What's going on in life? Oh, well, there's this one thing going on. There's this other thing going on. We gotta finish this project. And you take 20 minutes describing the guy, your project that you're about to finish, or this, this new business you're about to start, or this class you're about to take, or this, you know, this term paper you gotta hand in. It's always something. But Allah says these tiny milestones, what ends up happening is you forget where you're headed. You know, you have to go to one, then to the next, then to the next, and you, you, you stop realizing you're actually on a highway, and these are just small stops. Where does this highway end? What's the conclusion? Remember we talked this surah is about inevitability? What's the inevitable? Where are you going to end up? To your Lord. You're headed to your Lord. Whatever you're doing, you're rebelling against Allah, your life is about partying, your, your life is about business, your life is about studies, whatever your life is about, doesn't matter what road you take, they all lead one place. In the end, you are headed towards your Lord. And then Allah says, subhanAllah, فَمُلَاقِي You're headed to your Lord, meaning this, what it really means is, فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ Standing before your Lord. That's where you're, you're ending up. That's your real project. فَمُلَاقِهِ Rough translation means then you are going to meet him for sure. Then as a consequence of this toil, you're going to meet him. Now this work, this laborsome effort that the person is doing, isn't necessarily to please their Lord, they're just doing it for their life. It doesn't matter what you do it for though, you're still headed to your Lord. And you will, one of the translations of فَمُلَاقِهِ is that you will meet him. That you will meet, meaning your Lord. But it's been interpreted other ways also, like a sabuni in Safwat al Tafasir says, Famulaqin kadhak. You're going to meet your own labor. And this has been supported in the Quran. You can work so hard, maybe you'll see the fruits of your labor, maybe you won't. Even if you do see the fruits of your labor, those aren't really the fruits of your labor. Where do you see the real fruits of your labor? With Allah. That's where they really are. So when you get there, you'll come into contact with what you had been doing. Allah won't show you anything except what you've been doing yourself. They will find whatever they did standing right in front of them like a mirror. Everything that they used to work on. So this is the reality that's been depicted in إِنَّكَ كَادِحٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَدْحًا فَمُلَاقِي Whether we strive to please our Lord, whether we believe or we disbelieve, we're on this conveyor belt that's moving whether we like it or not. Whether we're sleeping or awake. Whether we're in college or we're working, whether we're married or unmarried, whether we're sick or we're healthy, there's no day off. We're constantly moving in that direction. You know, in a real, in a journey in life, you can take a break, you could stop. But there's not a moment that goes by that we're not on this journey. There's not a moment that goes by. That reality has been explained in these very few powerful words. That journey comes to a conclusion for the sky and the earth when it cracks and the earth stretches. Where does this journey come to conclusion for us? Where, how does it, and how, where is it, when we get to that, our Lord, what's going to happen there? Now that that door has been opened for that thought, that's what's coming next. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ Then as for the one who, has been, who, who had been given his book in his right hand. أُوتِيَ in the Arabic is different from يُؤْتَى يُؤْتَى is mudari, it's the present tense. The translation would have been, and as for the one who will be given his book in his right hand. Who will be given his book. But here it says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوتِيَ The one who had been given his book. 
This, by the way, in the Arabic, this is one of the things that's very confusing for a contemporary audience and can only be resolved when you're a serious student or at least have some appreciation of classical Arabic. In classical Arabic, past and present tense is not how we think of past and present tense in German and Spanish and English and Urdu or Farsi even. The past tense is a means by which you can deliver certainty. This is one of the means by which you can deliver certainty. Like, you know, there's nothing more certain than the past. So for sure, this, the, for the one for sure who, to whom his book has been handed in the right hand. Now, what book? In the previous surah, did we find a mention of books? Kalla inna kitab al-abrari The book of the righteous will be in the highest, right? That book that has the record, the roster of everyone. So you take out the notebook, the binder that, goes, that belongs to you from the book of the entire righteous, and then it gets handed to you in what hand? The, the right hand. It gets handed to you in, in that right hand. From that, from Al-Illiyin. So now this book that's handed to the right hand, let's, let's look at a couple of words in here that are really important. First of all, this is not the only place in the Qur'an where Allah talks about the book being handed in the right hand. We find, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ And he's going to say, هَا أُمُقْرَأُوا كِتَابِيَ Hey, come here, read my book. So the guy gets the book in his right hand. And he doesn't, it's like a graduation certificate, right? You don't want to just keep it in a shelf. What do you do with your, with your diploma? You put it on the wall, you, fence, you, know, you frame it. Look at that, 4.0 GPA, right? So you want to show it to people. So you get your book in your right hand and you want to show it. So he goes around the day, nobody cares on the day of judgment, but he can't hold himself. Iqra'u kitabi, or read my book. Inni dhanantu anni mulaqin. Same word that ends this surah. I was so sure that I'm going to come into contact with my, with my accountability. I was so worried about that too. I was sure that I'm gonna, Allah is going to show me my book and it's going to have everything I did. I used to be so worried about that. In has a nervousness in it even. I was so sure that I'm going to come to meet with my, account, my reckoning, my accountability. But here the first thing, beyond that, so what I want you to appreciate inshallah, this word about having the book given to you. The, the word yameen. The word yameen doesn't just mean right hand. In Arabic, it's an expression of power, number one. Okay, it's an expression of power. Number two, it's an expression of an agreement. When people shake their yameen or meet, have the yameen meet, the two hands meet, the right hand meet, it means a done deal. It's finished. This is the uh, kalam al-Arab. Okay, or even the verbal, the, the, the body language of the Arabs. When they would shake right hands on it, it's a done deal. It's finished. It doesn't have to be signed, sealed, notarized, or, or approved by a lawyer or whatever. It's done when they shook hands on it. Okay, and this is part of many ancient cultures. It's not so much anymore. You say we shook hands on it, man. Where's the money? <laughs> what hands? What are you talking about? Right? We don't have that culture anymore because usually our agreements are by email. There's no handshakes anymore. But anyway, here one of the things you have to understand: this person's been empowered by using of the word yamin. On a day where everybody will be weakened, this person's empowered. Empowered to the point. Remember, Allah told us, "Li kulli mri'im minhum yawma idhin sha'nun yughni." On, the, that per, on that day, there's going to be such a preoccupation on the Day of Judgment, such preoccupation, not worried about anything. Everybody's concerned about themselves. But this guy is empowered to the point where he can even go around and say, hey, read my book. Who's going to say, read my book on that day? <laughs> right? Except the one who's been given this freedom, this reign, this relaxation. So this is captured in فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ The other thing, it's an honor. The right hand is also considered an expression of Honor. And of, of course, we said fulfilling agreement. So he has that, as soon as he gets the book in his right hand, he knows Allah is, has agreed and fulfilled his agreement. He already knows where he's headed. That nervousness of the day of resurrection is gone. He's calmed down. But then Allah Azza wa adds, فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا Then as for the one, may Allah make us from these people, Allahumma حَاسِبْنَا حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا You know, the, the one who's been handed his book in his right, he will be, he will be audited. Yuhasab, muhasab, to have an audit, to have thorough accounting done for every last item in, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your finances or in your papers, right? Every last thing checked. He will be dealt with an audit that is easy. Hisab and yasira, an easy accounting and an easy reckoning. You know, this helps us understand in the previous surah when Allah told us the righteous are in bliss. They're lafi na'im. Right? In Al-Abrara, Lafi Na'im. No doubt the righteous, they are in blessings. What's the first blessing? Before they even get to Jannah, before they see all the, you know, the, the rewards of paradise, the first blessing is they get the book in their right hand. Already, ta'rifu fi wujuhihim nadratan na'im. You will recognize in their face the glow of bliss. Where did that glow come from? They got the book in their right hand. 
They, once they got that book, their place is lit up. Before you get that book, you're not sure which hand is going to get the book. You're not sure. You're nervous. As soon as you get the book, the face lights up. One of the most beautiful things I failed to mention in the previous surah, ta'rifu. You will recognize. Allah tells His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa you will recognize the bliss on their face. What does that mean? That the Messenger will be in their company. And this is another na'im that has been added to them that, you know, to recognize someone, you have to be able to see them, right? So He will be in their company, subhanahu, sallallahu alayhi wa This is another gift of Allah to the people of Jannah, subhanallah. Then finally, in this, uh, in this discussion, فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا yasira. Please understand the nervousness, the nervousness of the people before us. You know, we think, we're, we did enough good deeds, we did hajj, we pray, you know, we're not that bad. You know, we only miss salah once in a while or whatever. You, you, you get a feeling you're doing alright, you know, you're headed okay. Look at the nervousness the sahaba had, the, sahaba, the companions, the ones who were guaranteed par- paradise, right? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu says, if one of my feet was in paradise and the other wa ukhra kharijaha and the other was outside ma amintu makrallah i wouldn't feel safe from allah's plan with me i'm still not sure what allah has decided for me i'm still nervous you look at umar bin al-khattab radiyallahu anhu he says wallahi law nada munadin yawm al-qiyamah i swear by allah if a call the caller makes a call on the day of resurrection and kullun nasi fil jannah illa rajulun wahid that all, all people will enter Jannah, except one guy. A call has been made on the Day of Judgment, everyone will enter Jannah except one person. I would be convinced that's the son of Khattab. That's me, subhanAllah. This is the nervousness of the Sahaba. They earn paradise for a reason. We hear this and we say, okay, yeah, I get hisab and yaseer. I'm going to get the easy accounting. This is not the mentality of the people before us, because that will lead you to laziness. We want this, and you have to work for it. You know, this kadihun ila rabbika kadhan came first. This toil and this labor, now that toil and that labor has to be directed towards earning that, that, that easy reckoning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, two words for easy have been used. The word hayyin and the word yaseer. So this, this is the word yaseer, hisab and yaseer.